My presentation today will be about Soviet school in Russian literary translation uh, and uh, its fear of foreignization, which is a very important part of everything that this school believes in. Um, we don't really uh, use the term foreignization very often. Sometimes uh, students who graduated from universities and linguistic institutes do not know the word. Um, there is no even established tran translation of the term. Uh, we use, of course, the words foreignizatsia, domesticatsia. Frankly speaking, uh, they sound atrocious in Russian. Uh, also, we use achurdenia, asvoyenia, or even adamashnivania. Uh, but our normal words for this dichotomy that is so important for translators uh, for hundreds of years is bukvalism, which means literalism, and volnist, loose translation. Or, as they started calling it in Soviet times, realistický перевод, realistic translation, which is a very strange concept. I'll come back to it. Uh, in 19th century and early 20th century, we had a pretty normal situation when uh, the mainstream was domesticating, as everywhere, I believe, normally it is. Uh, but there were some foreignizing experiments, sometimes quite radical, like in the case of Biazimsky, for example, who translated Adolf in a very foreignizing manner, and Pushkin mocked him for this. Uh, but um, it was... It was, as I said, a fairly normal situation with uh, this coexistence of the two methods uh, in the culture. Uh, but at the beginning of Soviet era, uh, after the revolution, uh, there was a great project um, mainly inspired by Maxim Gorky. Um, <coughs> the project was to translate all foreign literature <laughs> in one piece and to give it to workers and peasants. Um, and it is important to remember, uh, actually, I, I'm not joking, I think it was a great project, very noble, very ambitious. And uh, many people um, who were target audience of this project were only yesterday were illiterate. Uh, so, of course, domestication was a very natural choice. Um, and uh, Maxim Gorky started World Literature Publishing House with this purpose of translating all world literature at once from all languages, or all the classics. And then uh, in 1967-1977, um, it was continuation of this project uh, in the shape of World Literature Library. Uh, it's 200 volumes and each had 300,000 uh, copies print run which is, uh, if we think about it, it's uh, quite impressive. Um, also, uh, and um, there is a quote in Russian uh, by Osip Mandelstam, uh, who said uh, that uh, uh, even at this stage, uh, there were some translations, because of course it was very difficult to find so many uh, translators to translate all world literature from all languages. Uh, so very often people were employed in new languages uh, from their uh, previous life, like they had, for example, French governesses. Uh, and of course they had no idea how to translate. Many of them had no idea how to translate, they just knew language. And very often, as it's often the case with an experienced translator, uh, their translations were very literalist. Uh, it was not any concept behind it. It was just that it's something that an experienced translator does, just translate word by word. And um, so there was some reaction against it. Uh, Osip Mandelstam wrote uh, in a newspaper uh, that this pedantic um, collation uh, with the original uh, doesn't matter so much. It's, uh, it's not important. What's important is uh, that each phrase should sound in Russian uh, in accordance with the spirit um, of the original. But at this point... Uh, there was still diversity. There was another publishing house, uh, Academia, uh, which was founded in 1921, and it existed up to 1937. And <coughs> it, was first, um, it first was located in St. Petersburg, and then it was transferred to Moscow. 
And this publishing house was very different in its purposes and its vision of translation. They didn't publish so many books, and probably their print runs were not such uh, amazing uh, amount of copies. But um, they uh, aimed at quality, and it included everything, uh, the paper, the fonts, uh, the illustrations, uh, commentary, footnotes, uh, very thorough research, and translation. And uh, in this publishing house, there were many people, very distinguished linguists and even philosophers, uh, who thought that the translation should be very uh, precise, very accurate. And uh, they also had something to react against, because um, at the very end of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century, uh, sometimes the translation was very loose, to the point that the name of the author was not mentioned at all. Uh, and uh, sometimes translators could skip the whole passages and chapters and rewrite a book. Uh, so they also had something they reacted against in uh, their desire to make everything uh, as accurate as possible. And also they were called formalists, mm -hmm. so they were very attentive to all formal features of the original. And um, actually, this publishing house was very suspicious. Even then, it was suspicious from the point of view of the authorities, uh, because formalism, even then, was not particularly, particularly Soviet in spirit. And um, some translations uh, by the people who worked in academia for many years served as an example of bad translation, bookvalist, literalist translation. One of the books in question is um, Pickwick Papers, which was translated by uh, two translators, a husband and wife team, Kriftsova, Alexander Kriftsova and Evgeny Lan. Uh, and it was, uh, there was also commentary which probably had no precedent I I ever uh, by Spiet, by Gustav Spiet. That's, uh, unfortunately, uh, you can't see it very well, but it's three volume Pickwick papers in Russian published by Academia. And here are people in question who um, are known in Russian culture as people who produced extremely bad translations. Uh, it's um, uh, Evgeny Lan and Gustav Spiet. In fact, uh, people who um, condemn their translation normally don't read it. It's just uh, a commonplace. It's something that everybody knows, common knowledge. Um, the commentary is amazing. Uh, actually, it's, um, it's not just commentary to separate lines of the book, uh, but uh, there are separate chapters telling the reader how life in England at the time was organized or what kind of carriages there were in the streets, what people drank, what they ate, what was uh, cultural situation. Uh, all minute details of everyday life was de were described and illustrated. Um, so it was very much a kind of enlightening book uh, telling about English culture and not just presenting the translation. And the translation was very accurate <coughs> and included a lot of uh, words unexisting in Russian, such as atarnyi, solicitor, barrister. Uh, and then there was a huge explanation of all complicated legal system in England. Because as uh, we all understand, for Charles Dickens, uh, this legal system was very important. He used to work there as a reporter when he was young, and it was a permanent topic of uh, many chapters of his novels. Um, Gustav Spiet was uh, executed, not for this particular commentary <laughs> or translation, uh, but in a way, in a way uh, he was executed for being formalist, and it was part of his formalist activity, so in a way for this too. And as for Evgeny Lan, he escaped, but he committed suicide, double suicide together with his wife later. Uh, but uh, he, he was in permanent danger, um, and uh, at some point he was accused of being a uh, cosmopolite, uh, as, as you know, was an euphemism of being Jewish, which he, wa he was. And uh, mostly these accusations uh, were 
uh, produced by Ivan Kashkin. And Ivan Kashkin is another very famous name, and he was a fine translator, and he founded the school of literary translation, uh, which were called Kashkinci, uh, or Kashkinki, because mostly they were women. And uh, they really, he really brought up the whole generation of fine translators, no doubt about it. But Ivan Kashkin was also um, into translation theory, and uh, he um, was... Uh, he was quite certain that there is right method of translation and wrong method of translation. He was very aggressive towards those who did not share his views, and maybe it had also something to do with competition, because though print runs were enormous, these place uh, translators actually probably once in history translators were well paid, uh, <laughs> and um, it was and there were very few of them. It was very close shop. Uh, so they uh, had to fight for this place under the sun, and Kashkin was really a fighter. Uh, so uh, he condemned academia, Lan, uh, and uh, the rest of them. And especially he was uh, adamant that Georgi Shengeli should not be uh, kept near the translation. And Georgi Shengeli was uh, also quite distinguished translator, uh, who, among other things, uh, he translated Don Juan by Byron. And um, his translation was much more accurate than anything that was produced before. Kashkin was very critical towards this um, translation, and especially he, especially he stressed that the fact that Shengeli, uh, Shengeli showed Suvorov uh, not in a very flattering way. Interestingly, there was no question of um, comparing it with the original. Uh, here is very interesting, very interesting phrase. He says that Soviet school, Kashkin says that a Soviet school uh, of translation does not teach translator uh, to be unrespectful uh, to a great historical figure. So it's no, no question, actually, whether Byron was not respectful enough towards Suvorov. It was the fact that uh, Kashkin distorted the image of this great man. Uh, uh, hmm? Shungeli, sorry. Uh, and it was a very dangerous accusation. It was done publicly in press. And Suvorov, one, one of the favorite uh, historical figures of Stalin. So actually, Shengeli was extremely lucky that Stalin died soon afterwards. <laughs> uh, it's not a joke. It was all about death and life, which is probably a little bit hard to believe today, but that's how it was. Um, meanwhile, another translation of Don Juan appeared uh, by Tatiana Gnedich. Um, she was in prison uh, when she started, also as political prisoner, uh, when she started translating. And... Um, then she made her translation, which is much looser than Shengelis, and Kashkin praised it as uh, the translation as it should be, comparing to Shengeli. Uh, interestingly, one of my students uh, wrote a paper about all this situation, and he really went very deep into it. And what he, um, uh, his statement was that uh, Tatiana Gnedich took into account all critical um, statements of Kashkin in her translation of Don June. And she tried very carefully to avoid everything that uh, might be unpleasant to Kashkin, Suvorov, etc. Uh, if we take this particular example with Suvorov, uh, her text is much more complimentary to him than Shengelis or Byron's, because Byron is not very complimentary to Suvorov, indeed. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, it was proven in this paper, student's paper, it was proven beyond reasonable doubt that uh, she really was so much based upon Kashkin's uh, articles. But it looks like it. It looks convincing. And uh, it's also very logical because Kashkin by the time was very influential. And if he decided to write in some paper that she also distorted um, something important in the original, she might go back to prison very well. So uh, it was uh, only normal caution on her part to be careful about uh, places in question. 
Uh, now the next name uh, that uh, comes to us uh, in this connection is Karnei Tchaikovsky, uh, who wrote the most popular book in Russian about translation, Vysoko Iskustva, Translation as Fine Art, which is still the most influential book, and which is, again, it's a fine book. It's witty, funny, uh, intelligent. Uh, but um, the problem with the book was that it became a Bible, and you couldn't contradict anything that was written there. Uh, actually, I want to underline uh, my point that not the trouble is not that um, this realistic school won uh, the battle. The problem was because I think that if foreignizing or translation of bookvalism uh, would win this battle, it could be even worse. The problem was that there was a battle and there was a winner. And uh, the other method uh, was condemned as they thought then forever. Uh, and it's like, for example, imagine that people who write prose argue whether you should write a novel or a short story and someone wins and then nobody is permitted to write novels anymore. Uh, that's the situation of this kind. Because unfortunately it all went into the political ground rather than uh, just uh, some creative argument. It became very much ideological, political point because uh, everything formalist, everything bookvillist, literalist was suspicious, not ours, not of our spirit, Soviet spirit. And as for this term, realistic translation, it's an invention of Kashkin and Gasparov with uh, characteristic acid accuracy uh, takes this case with Suvorov and says that's realistic translation for you. If you think that Suvor Suvorov is a great man and Byron doesn't think so, you translate not what Byron said, but the reality behind it as you see it. Mm -hmm. um, and Kashkin himself never explained it so clearly. He was extremely vague about what exactly realistic translation was. Uh, but it was quite obvious uh, that it was just good translation. And it's funny how people like the great theorists uh, of translation, like Kamisara, for example, he writes very clearly, very honestly, that if we define the term bookvalism, we should just say that it's bad translation. So there was no real attempt to uh, work with it as a concept. It was just bad translation comparing to realistic translation that is good. So. Um, Another book uh, that was uh, and is extremely influential is Nora Gall, also a fine, wonderful translator. The word alive and dead. And again, it's a wonderful book, very useful even today for practical translator. But um, the problem is that, of course, there are things that are outdated, that are not um, uh, that are not true anymore because translation is this kind of dynamic process. Or sometimes she was just mistaken and it wasn't her fault because she didn't have tools to check uh, her assumptions. Like, for example, today we have corpus of Russian language and uh, we can check uh, how words were used in 19th century. And they didn't. So when, when she said, we can't use this word, it never was used in 19th century, she's often mistaken. Uh, but nobody could check it. And even now, to say that she was wrong uh, might provoke a lot of anger uh, in some people. Um, so, bookvalism, even now, is regarded as translator's mistake, as slavish imitation of the original, and just wrong method. And all these three accusations always, always are mentioned uh, in definitions uh, in theoretical works. Now, the only voice in defense of bookvalism in Soviet era was from uh, Mikhail Leonovich Kasparov. And this is my hero when uh, we speak about translation and many other things. Uh, I think that uh, actually for some reason he was not restricted uh, by this dichotomy and uh, because of it uh, his works are the most... Uh, the most significant of everything that was written uh, about translation in Soviet time. Uh, I would like to mention two articles. Uh, one is Shakespeare's sonnets, Marshak's translations, which he wrote uh, in co-authorship with his niece, Aftanom, Natalia Aftanomova. And she was a student at her last year at the university at the time. So her diploma paper was this research, 
in translation of uh, Shakespearean sonnets by Marshall. And Gasparov actually wrote the article. Mm. And as a result, she couldn't go to postgraduate studies at the university because the Department of English uh, Language was so appalled they wouldn't let her, with all her excellent marks, to go and study further. And for Gasparov, it was that he couldn't participate in publication of five-volume collection of Marshak's works uh, because uh, the uh, general opinion was that they insulted Marshak, though they didn't. Uh, they say all the time that his translations are wonderful, but they show how they create absolutely different image, absolutely different text, and uh, how and it's brilliantly written article. Um, but it was uh, taken very much as an insult. Uh, and uh, another uh, very significant work was Brusov and Bukvalism, because Brusov, as uh, in fact many other people, changed his translation method during his life, because when he was younger, he very much advocated loose translation, especially in poetry, and he said that you should just take it as an impression and then give the same impression. Uh, but then uh, he somehow got uh, closer to Bukvalist uh, view, and he, uh, he made uh, the translation of Enid, which is very, very literalist, and it was, again, laughing stock for everyone, but Kasparov uh, said, he was the first to say that uh, bukvalism, literalism, is not a curse word, it's scientific notion. And it was uh, like a bomb, because uh, when this article was first published in uh, 1971, it was surrounded by two other articles explaining how wrong he is. Um, another, actually he made two very important statements in this article. One is that different translations are used for different purposes. Uh, that they have uh, basically uh, different objectives. And he said very interesting thing that uh, loose translation is for a consumer and literary translation is for producer to develop his abilities and the abilities of the language. And um, the second thing was dynamic view on translation, because Gasparov was the first, uh, I, I mean, of course, Soviet, uh, Soviet discourse, translation discourse, who said uh, that um, it is changing, depending on how well we know another culture, that civilization uh, gets to know civilization in the same way that one person gets to know another. First, they need to see something in common, and here comes loose translation that shows you that it's basically the same. Uh, and then uh, they need something um, different to, be, to uh, continue to be interested. And here comes uh, literally sort of foreignizing uh, translation, if you wish, which shows you something new about the culture that you didn't know and that is different from your own culture. And this is very important. Actually, I think it's uh, the most important drawback, the most important consequence of all this um, bookvalism, realistic translation fight is that in our theoretical discourse, we still do not, the majority of people do not recognize that there is this dynamics, that something that is good today may be not so good tomorrow, not so suitable for the cultural situation. <coughs> so the situation how it formed was that there were black sheep and sacred cows, and one perfect translation was um, needed for all times. Uh, and uh, that's another thing that is still here, very much so, uh, that people think that there is a possibility to create perfect translation. Yesterday there was a quote that each generation much, must have his own translation. Uh, not in our country even now. Uh, the idea is that there is some perfect translation, and if it's achieved, everybody can rest. <laughs> That's it. Moreover, it in a way replaces the original. Um, and that's another very interesting thing. Uh, yes, but um, I want to note even now, I come back to it a little bit later, that uh, this idea that uh, actually though many people, many theorists in uh, Russia say that foreignization is just fancy word for bookvalism to cover it. Uh, in fact, it's not the same thing. 
and uh, though translation uh, had to be domesticating, there were be- many foreignizing techniques employed uh, by Soviet school of translation. For example, all the footnotes, all the commentaries, all the introductions are certainly foreignizing techniques because uh, it destroys the illusion that you read something that was originally written in Russian, uh, which is the most important thing for domesticating translation. So it was interesting situation when translation worked completely for domestication and all, uh, all tradition of publishing worked for foreignizing and still does. We still uh, have a lot of footnotes, uh, commentaries, uh, introduction uh, and uh, the rest of it. Now, uh, all this situation was not so harmful for practical translation, strangely enough, as for theory. Because in practice, translators followed their guts sometimes. And there were translators that were not so much in the system, like Viktor Goloshev, uh, who always was very accurate, and when he translated Faulkner, he didn't put an extra uh, uh, comma or uh, full stop. He, um, actually, as you can imagine, that Faulkner is not Hemingway, so it's really difficult. But if Faulkner has a sentence for two pages, Goloshev has the same. Uh, also, there, there is Nina Dimurova, uh, who is a very peculiar case in children's literature, and she also was not a system translator. She was not even in uh, Soyuz Pisateli, a uh, union of writers where everybody had to belong. Uh, actually, she was not accepted. Uh, and she is very famous translator. Translator can be famous uh, because uh, she uh, made the best translation of Alice in Wonderland, which is widely read. And, uh, but uh, I, I wish to say some words how this uh, uh, book came her way. Because it was, actually, it was no way that uh, the translator of this kind, not in the system, would get such important book to translate. But uh, uh, there was, uh, it, it was published in Sofia. And actually, it was because, uh, so, uh, hmm? Uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, actually it was because of some um, important person, some important official, uh, who was in charge uh, of translation of Bulgarian books into Russian, oh. saw this nice title, because uh, they translated the book in Bulgaria at the time. And he said, I want it to be translated from Bulgarian. And though people told him that initially it was written in English, so probably uh, <laughs> we shouldn't translate it from Bulgarian, he, he was very angry. And he said, I want it to be translated. And so it got somehow, not exactly in the system, uh, but uh, through the back door. And someone said to Nina Dimurova, who knew that she was doing it with her students, some bits and pieces of Alice, that she should do it. So she did it, and it was published in Bulgaria. And um, that's how it mm, happened. And it was, uh, the translation was more accurate than all other translations of Alice. But it was domesticating enough. It was a book for children. But at some point, uh, we had a publishing house, literat- uh, well, a publishing series, Literaturni Pamitniki, the monuments of world literature, um, which traditionally had a lot of commentaries and um, were heavily an- annotated. And uh, she, um, and uh, as you probably know, there is annotated Alice by Martin Gardner. And they decided to publish it uh, in the series. And Dimurova was asked to uh, translate his commentary. And it probably was the only case in all history of translation when the translator completely changed, completely rewrote uh, her translation because of this situation with commentary. Because um, that's um, the other edition. Because, for example, she had, instead of mock turtle, he had a mock um, seal, uh, seal skin, uh, like uh, as a fur, as a mock fur. But when you have commentary by Gardner explaining about turtle soup, and you have illustration by Tenniel showing this, you cannot very well make it a seal rather than turtle. And uh, there were also all the parodies and in Gardner's book, of course, he explained uh, that uh, this verse mm, mocks uh, Isaac Watts. 
and uh, because as Isaac Watts was someone who wrote children's poetry uh, with a lot of didactic element explaining that everybody uh, shouldn't lie, should work hard, etc. And uh, that was uh, basically a torture of everybody's, uh, everybody's childhood, which Dickens mentions and Mill mentions and uh, Carol mentions. Uh, and so uh, she reworked her translation very heavily. Uh, there were uh, translations uh, made specially for these poems that were mm, paradised and uh, new uh, poems in the book. Uh, and uh, it was probably the only case of a kind, because as I said, uh, there was this notion that there is one perfect translation, and if you need to make commentary, take it, make commentary, because it's perfect. Uh, now, there was another interesting case. Um, I want to say that, uh, though I said earlier that uh, uh, foreignization might have won. It's not exactly so, because uh, foreignization was doomed in the situation uh, of censorship. Because uh, this accuracy doesn't go well with censorship, and I'll show you why. Uh, <clears throat> it's um, our main literary magazine that deals with translations, uh, international literature or foreign literature, as it was called later. And uh, this magazine tried to publish Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls for some time. Actually, uh, the story spent 30 years. Uh, these attempts to publish the book were uh, done again and again, and uh, they only succeeded in 20 or 30 years' time. Uh, but how this translation looked like, and looks like still, look at this. Uh, in red, it's uh, original text. Uh, in uh, black, it's what... Uh, remained in Russian translation, and blue shows the change. Um, or, I never think at all, I'm General Sovietic, I never think. Uh, of course, it was unacceptable. So that's uh, actually the extent, <laughs> it's the extent uh, to which uh, they changed the text. As you can very well see, no accuracy, bookvalism, literalism, foreignization, uh, just come, can't come into it. Um, the other case, uh, which is very curious, is the case of Russian Salinger. Uh, because it's, it was another fight. By the way, uh, translators actually were the people who fought for the book to be published. They were smugglers. Uh, they took some book they liked and they, they convinced their officials that it was not so dangerous, that in fact it was even socialist in a way, uh, and uh, etc. And so Rita Wright Kovalyova, who is a famous, the most famous translator uh, in Russia, there is a joke, well, actually anecdote, probably the true story that the Vladov reports how uh, Vera Panova, a Russian writer, asked him whose Russian language, uh, literary language, is the best nowadays, and he said, Rita Wright uh, produces the best literary language. And she said, but she's translator. So do you mean to say that Wonigut or Salinger sounds better in uh, Russian than Fedin? And he said, of course. And Panova said, but that's awful. Uh, also, uh, so she was uh, a hero. And uh, by the way, this uh, very peculiar position of the translator in the culture dealt with the fact that there was uh, mostly uh, Russian original literature was censored even more than translations. So the best books, only, the only real books, were translations. And translators were people who uh, smuggled them and gave them to the readers. So their position was very strong and very respectful. And, uh, well, uh, uh, I wanted to mention this dynamic thing. Uh, Rita Wright translates uh, hamburger as butterbrot s <laughs> um, yeah. uh, And it was very logical. Actually, she knew what it was, because she went to, uh, to the States, and she knew American uh, everyday culture quite well. But her reader had no clue. So actually, she was completely right. But for today's translator, of course, it would be a very strange solution, because everybody knows what hamburger is. Uh, now, uh, Liliana Lungina, another translator, um, we um, uh, had a story from uh, one of her acquaintances uh, that she had this hamburger in her book she was translating once. 
and she didn't know what it was, and she asked her husband, what do you think it was? He said, you know, I think it's some kind of raincoat. <laughs> and she said, yes, okay, my hero uh, carries in, it, it, um, in the hand. Probably I should say that he has it over his arm. <laughs> uh, the husband said, yes, it would be a good, good idea. Uh, and then she said, uh, she came to the kitchen where he was, and he said, you know what, he ate it. Uh, um, well, uh, on the other hand, butterbrot's katliety, the solution of Ritterite, is something that a mother gives you when you go to school or to work or whatever. So it's uh, some food made at home by definition. While hamburger, if we take its uh, semiotic meaning, is a street food, quick food. So probably bilash would be uh, better, though bilash in New York would probably also be puzzling. Um, uh, but, of course, these funny things about butterbrot's katliety instead of hamburger is not, uh, is not a problem with Rita uh, translation. It's a good translation of its time. It omits a lot. And especially in stories by Salinger, many things are changed, um, and they are very much simplified. But uh, that was how Salinger came to Russian readership, and that's uh, the texts that people know from their childhood. Recently, Max Nemtsov, um, a translator, uh, made new translation of, uh, of Salinger, of all works by Salinger. Mm. And, well, I'll come back to it in a minute. And um, the general public was appalled, not by his translation itself, because basically nobody read it, but by the fact that he translated Salinger, who was already translated, as we remember forever, uh, by Rita Reich. So it was taken as aggressive act towards respectful person, Rita Reich. Salinger didn't come into it at any point. Uh, and especially everybody was, uh, actually there was content uh, on the internet, so uh, the text that everybody discussed were the titles of the stories. And uh, people were uh, very unhappy about the titles. Because, for example, one of the story had title Дядюшка um, Хроманок в Коннектикуте and Rita Rai translated it as, as La Parastyapa. Uh, and um, everybody said, how, where did he take this uh, um, lame uncle uh, from Connecticut when uh, Kovalova had such good title? And in fact, it was Uncle Wiggly in Connecticut in Salinger's case. Uh, which is not something abstract, but very concrete, lame rabbit. Uh, and that's why it was so funny. Interestingly, uh, when there was annotated Salinger in Soviet times, there was commentary explaining that in the original, this story was, call, was called Uncle Wiggly in Connecticut, and um, it's uh, the rabbit invented by this and that writer, etc. Very important to Salinger because he read it when, when a boy. Uh, but that was this curious thing that uh, commentaries were sometimes made to unexisting text. There was no notion that uh, to make annotated edition, you need to make separate translation, translation for this particular purpose. So this idea of purpose that translation might have was completely foreign to basically everybody, except Dimurova. Um, uh, well, probably I should mention that some theoretical thought about the problem uh, appeared after Perestroika. Uh, there was a book by Vadim Rudnev, Winnie Pooh and the Philosophy of Everyday Language. And here we can see very clearly that foreignization and accuracy are not the same thing. Rudnev uh, said that there are two types of translation, synthetic translation, uh, which is like Stanislavski's theater, when you make people believe in everything that is happening, which is, we understand, again, uh, another guise of domesticating. And analytic translation, like Brecht theater, where you remember every moment that it's theater, it's not real thing. And he actually, what he did was uh, working in the context when Winnie the Pooh is known to everybody in Zahader's translation. And he was operating on the assumption that everybody remembers the book by heart. So his translation was foreignizing, but completely inaccurate. He translated Winnie the Pooh uh, using style of Faulkner. 
Uh, and it's very strange translation. Actually, his wife did it, but um, by his specification. Uh, but um, it's very strange translation, very foreignized and intentionally. So he said, I want uh, to make it clear that it's not just a children's book. And that's why he uh, chose something that was um, grown up reading and elitist at that. And uh, so he, it was his way of saying it's not a children's book. Uh, and it was quite a curious experiment, which again was met with extreme hostility by the establishment, whatever it means. Well, um, I don't have much time left because I want to leave time for questions. So I say just some, wor some words. Um, uh, so probably the most important, uh, uh, the most important uh, thing about uh, this division into bad literalism and good realistic translation is again uh, that we didn't have uh, the understanding that there can be different translation with different purposes. There was this illusion that we don't need new translation when we already have one. And um, there was um, extreme and is extreme reluctance to, uh, to see it as dynamic process. And uh, we, um, uh, me and Viktor Sonkin, who sits here, uh, we have a workshop of literary translation in Moscow State University. And at some point we decided that we need to make real books with our students because um, that's how actually people learn uh, their trade. And um, their craft. And um, so we uh, compiled two anthologies by now. This one is published, the other one is to be published very soon. And we uh, chose this foreignizing approach uh, because we thought that we want um, academic books with uh, annotated books, even uh, though there were crime stories in the first, uh, in the first instance, Victorian crime stories of con by contemporaries of Conan Doyle, and in the second case, uh, in between the wars, uh, British crime story in this interwar period between the two world wars. And uh, we decided to uh, come back to the experience of Academia Publishing House because I always thought that the translation of Kripsov Ilan are very good translations and that Spetz's commentary is absolutely brilliant. So we went back to this forgotten practice and we made a book where we, from the start we knew that we are going to have glossary, commentary, uh, and even picture glossary, as you can see here. And we don't want to translate all Victoria's dog carts, handsome caps, it's just carriage, 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 equipage, equipage, equipage. <coughs> that we want to leave it all in the text and then show it, um, how it looked like, how it was uh, constructed, etc. And... Um, we also came back to this attempt of uh, this academia crowd uh, to explain about solicitors, barristers, about uh, Oxford, because the majority of writers who wrote between the wars were from Oxford or Cambridge. So they had a lot of stories about Oxford with all minute details. So we kept it all in the text and then explained and showed how um, gown of common is different from gown of scholar, uh, how MA and BA addressed what is bathing machine, by the way, because it, it very often is mentioned in British literature, but it was always translated in su such a domesticated way that nobody in Russia had a clue what bathing machine was. And uh, we sort of brought it back uh, to the audience. Um, and I don't say, again, I don't say that it's how it should be, but that's how it should be in the case of annotated book. The translation should take it into account that uh, there will be commentary. So you make a strategy from this point. And um, I think that very important, uh, very important thing that happened after Perestroika, that diversity uh, is coming back. But unfortunately, it's not very much celebrated yet. Uh, by the readership or theorist. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alexander, for a fascinating presentation. I think that there are many questions and comments on, on this. First question is uh, 
uh, how is this uh, anno this new annotated uh, translation? Who is publishing it and who is reading it? Um, the first book was published by Inastranka Publishing House that was initially based on this uh, magazine, Foreign Literature. But then uh, the chief editor went to some other publishing house and now we went together with the chief editor and her team uh, because we believe that uh, this is a team of people, who are, now it's Corpus, uh, who understands about books and uh, really go deeply into it. So uh, they publish it. And the first book was very successful. It's got uh, the Book of the Year Award in debut nomination. And strangely, actually, we uh, looked in what people wrote in their live journals and blogs. And actually, people were extremely glad to have introduction, commentaries, <laughs> uh, glossaries. So probably some people missed it. But of course, also, of course, our readership is not 300,000 uh, uh, copies, and it doesn't need to be, because the important thing uh, is to admit that there are different readers, and they deserve to have different books and translations. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the Murava's work in Bulgaria, and I'm, I'm thinking about how, how, how much did this Soviet situation influence the work in, in the socialist in the Soviet countries? She did work in Bulgaria. She yeah. translated from English, uh, yeah. sitting at home. She just went to Bulgaria okay. to get her fee yeah. uh, for it. And actually, uh, they were very much surprised there that she didn't speak Bulgarian, having fee for translating a Bulgarian book. Yeah. <laughs> because I have, I, I, I have an example, which I was wondering about just... By chance, I happened to, to read this just two weeks ago. The translation into Czech of, of, of uh, Dorothy Sayers' Murder Must Advertise, uh -huh. published in the 1960s. And it's actually domesticating because he's changing the, the name of, of the, to make the jokes and, the, and you know, the, the advertising to make it funny yes. in Czech. But still, he has a long introduction. Well, it's actually at the end, but describing what's, uh, what is cricket. And how cricket works, and with yes, it's important. It's, it's novel because here. they have this cricket yeah, match. Yes, because don't have any cricket terminology in, in Czech. So yeah. very sort of long, and, but also this kind of introduction that explains that yes, this is really about society and capitalist society with all these yes, of with crime and so it's all that, but also then this long. About yes, how, it was often, often used this way that yeah. uh, uh, translators said something about capitalist society and of course it uh, only concerns capitalist society and then uh, wrote what they wanted. Yeah. But did they have to follow, did they have to sort of look at the Soviet would they condemn bookvalism also in, in, in the other countries? Do That's something that? I don't know. I think that in different countries it probably was a different situation. I think that this strong hostility to literalism was a uh, Russian uh, thing mostly. Any more questions? Why do you think this Russian re re kind of... Um, why, why did it come, this realistic translation? Why, where does it come from in the Russian culture that, that you... But, and especially the thing that they, there is one, one, once it's translated, it's translated and that's it. I think partly this idea uh, with finalizing translation as uh, canon uh, deals with the situation of uh, Iron Curtain and a complete isolation of Soviet Union. The idea was that people do not lo know foreign languages, they don't need to know them, they will never see the original. Original sort of doesn't really exist. Uh, and uh, the only thing that exists is the translation. And it was already edited, censored, and that's it. No more. But because I remember when I... I agree with Commissar when he says that actually uh, 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 translation is a zamenito, original. In a way, yes, because of course if I take a book I want to read and I don't want to see that it's a translation. I want to read it as that. I enjoy the book. But, of course, it's, uh, yeah, it's also very dangerous in that the only way. Uh, the thing is that, for example, you don't want to see that it is a translation, but some people do. Yeah. So why, why not have three translations? We had, uh, we had Adam Foltz, uh, a young British writer who was shortlisted for Booker Prize. Uh, he was a guest of our workshop. And he said that he read uh, War and Peace, uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace in three different translations. And uh, he had very good idea of the book because of different approaches of translations. So there are some people who enjoy this kind of comparison and let them have it. Yeah, I could also add, for example, you, you mentioned tra translations of Tolstoy into English. 
And there has also been this quarreling about, well, the same kind of reactions, I think, you know, with the new, the new translations by this Pevier yeah, and, and Slavkonsky, which has been criticized because you're, you're sort of intruding on, on, on the classical uh, translations by Garnett. And, I and, believe and they were not criticized for that because between Garnett and them, there are probably three or yeah, four or five other, other translations. Sure. They uh, employ a lot of foreignizing techniques, that's true. Yeah. But actually, we, we read um, some chapters of Master and Margarita in their translations and Anna Karenina, and we th thought it was very good translation. So yeah. we actually um, enjoyed it. Yeah, but I, I, I mean that I think the, the English reading public, which also is in the same situation anyway, because they don't read Russian. Actually, so some, some part of uh, British and American uh, audience uh, love the translations. Uh, translations never were so popular. Their sales are amazing. And actually, they brought back um, some prestige to translators' profession. So it's not yeah. exactly the case. Um, yeah, the criticism yeah. was mostly coming from Russia. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a good yeah. point. It's true. Yeah. It's true. It was mostly coming from Russia. Yeah. I also read in, in, in sort of American. Yeah, yeah but there are, yeah. there are many yeah. uh, very good yeah. reviews yeah. in Britain and America. Yeah. So it's not yeah. this kind yeah. of. Yeah. Alexander, can I make one yes. question? So is there any uh, research going on this, in this uh, Soviet school of translation and this vocalism and things like that? Because it's extremely interesting. And uh, well, uh, many of my students uh, do this kind of research into censorship and uh, uh, bookvalism and these uh, political fights. <laughs> and of course, other people do as well. But it's not institutionalized. Yeah, because I, I cannot find that kind of research. Yes, it's very real, and it, is, uh, it still meets with a lot of hostility from uh, a <coughs> theoretical establishment. Do we have still have maybe time for a couple or one question? Well, actually, I haven't got a question. I just want to thank you for, for the, the very interesting sort of illumination of, of one particular translation culture that you know, I've done and what many views there are. I think that's, that's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Alex.